Hi, today I thought we'd continue with the LED ring light project and we'll actually go through step by step selecting the parts, the general topology and actually designing the electronics to go on the LED ring light. So let's get started looking at the LEDs. So the LEDs that we used on the prototype board were these Cree X-Lamp MX3 LEDs and we had eight of them on the board and driving them at 300 milliamps we're getting around 100 lumens per LED or 800 lumens in total. So that's a kind of benchmark that we want to aim for because that was giving us more light into the microscope than any of the ring lights that I've got in the lab and with the addition of some collimating lenses or some other optics will increase that light output even further. So here we've got the Cree X-Lamp directional LEDs comparison table. And in, the thing that's important in this design is probably the efficiency because we haven't really got the luxury for big heat sinks. It's gonna be hanging off the lens, so we don't want loads of weight on this board. So what we've got here is a comparison table where we can quickly see the efficacy of various different types of LEDs. And immediately we can see these Cree XTE LEDs are pretty good. And then we've got the XP G3s in two different variants. So we've got the standard and then the S line. I suspect the S line LEDs are either a little bit more tricky to find or just more expensive. But these are looking pretty good. And at their test current, you can see here that we're getting LED outputs very close to actually what we want to get from the entire design. So if we have four of these, then we're definitely going to be in the area that we want to be aiming for. So let's have a look at DigiKey and see if we can actually get hold of some of these. So we'll start by looking at the Cree XTEs. And we want to be looking for active parts and not obsolete ones and also in stock because I do actually want to order these parts and probably the most important thing that we've got here is the color rendering index because we do want to be able to identify colors quite well. Let's have a look at those with the CRI of 90 and you can see we've got a problem here. So we've got zero remaining about 85 and still zero remaining. So those are looking pretty poor from DigiKey. We can also look at Mauser. But I suspect if DigiKey haven't got them, then Mauser won't either. Now, for whatever reason, these LEDs are always the most difficult to search for. I always spend ages trying to find the actual LED that I want to use. So, uh, again, 90 and 93. And have they got any in stock? And they do actually have two of these in stock. Let's have a look what these are. Warm white and warm white. So it's probably not going to do the job. We do want something in the region of 5000 Kelvin so that we get the color temperature correct. So I don't think these are going to be correct. So here are the 5000 Kelvin items. CRI of 90. No, so it's not looking good for the Cree XTEs. Let's try looking at the next ones, which are the XP G3s. And again, CRI of 90, 70 remaining. Active item 62, have we got any in stock? Nope. So that's a little bit frustrating. Let's have a look at the DigiKey search instead and just see if they have actually got anything with a high CRI. So we've got some very high CRI devices on here. And we want active parts in stock. 128 remaining. Let's see what we've got. So we've got some from LumiLeds. Uh, we've got some pretty small ones, which are these Cree ones. Um, they're not really in the right region here. 30 lumens isn't going to do the job. Let's also sort by that. So we've got a couple of options here. Unfortunately, none of them are perfect. But we've got this Luxian Z LED, which only has an output of 190 lumens, but it has a really good color rendering index of 90 and is relatively cheap, £2.23. So we can have four of those and it not be too expensive. Next choice would be this Cree XP50, which I think is the one that was in that torch that I reviewed quite a long time ago. These are really high output LEDs, way more than we need. But possibly what we could do here is just underdrive it 
and again we'll get a decent color rendering index and I know that there are plenty of optics available for the Cree XHP 50s. The other option here is these Luxian LMZ9s which basically just look like four of the Luxian Z dies on one chip. These are a little bit tricky to, handy, uh, to handle along with the Luxian Z. They're really quite small. Um, so I think we're going to look at this Cree XHP 50A. And so it looks like it's got two banks of LEDs in it. No internal schematic of the LED. Uh, but here you can see you can either have the two lots of LEDs in parallel. So six volts, it looks like two dies by two dies. Or you can have them in series to give a 12 volt um, input voltage at their rated current. So these could do the job. Again, we probably don't need to drive them anywhere near their maximum and we wouldn't be able to dissipate all that heat anyway. But these are quite big devices, 5x5 five five millimeters or so. So quite easy to handle. The footprint shouldn't be too much of a challenge. Let's see if we can find some optics for this part. So for the optics, we can look on the LEDIL website. They tend to do most of the optics for these parts. Um, we've got, we want to look for something that's relatively small in terms of the lens size. So we've got some here that are 22 by 22 millimeters or so. 50 degree beam, so it's a little bit wider than probably what we need. But it's a frosted lens and we saw previously that gives us the best results. Let's see if we can actually get hold of one of these. It basically looks like this. See if we can find it anywhere. Mauser and RS and Digikey as well. So they've got those. Uh, plenty in stock at RS. Plenty in stock at Mauser. And none at Digikey. So that one, that looks probably fine. I think we're quite good with that. That looks quite reasonable. It looks like you heat stake this into your PCB as well. So quite easy mounting. So we'll add that to the list. So now we can start looking at the actual electronics. Now that we've chosen our LED, we know roughly how we want to be able to drive it. We definitely don't need to be able to drive this LED at 3 amps. We're just not going to be able to dissipate that kind of heat on the PCB. Let's have a look and see if we've got any curves for what the luminous intensity is versus current. We may need a slightly different data sheet for this. So actually it looks like at 3 amps we're massively overdriving this LED. It's got the luminous flux here, relative luminous flux, which is basically compared to the value that they've given in the data sheet. So 800 lumens at 100% is actually 1.5 amps at 6 volts. So if we know that, then we know roughly we can scale that back. Even 50% is more than sufficient. So actually, we're probably fine just driving this LED with a standard 700 milliamp LED driver. And we know that we're going to be able to get about 50% of that light output. So we'll be able to get um, 400 lumens from one LED, which is pretty good. So now we know we need to aim for something in the region of 0 to 1 amps with 6 volt per LED. We can start looking for some driver chips. So I've brought up the JLC PCB website because most likely I'm going to try and get as much of this PCB assembled as possible. We're going to order the boards from here and try and use parts mainly that they've got in stock. I don't know how feasible that actually is and it will be quite a simple PCB so it may not be too much of a burden to assemble but if you go on to this page here you can see what parts they've actually got available for assembly. Now you can sort of do a search in here so we've got driver ICs and then we've got LED drivers we've got 573 available but the search at this point then is quite Poor. You don't really want to be searching for parts on here. You can't see what's in stock because you can't search by the amount of stock that they've got. And as you can see, they often have parts that aren't available. So let's have a look at LCSC. And unfortunately, they don't have everything that they have at LCSC. But often you can see what kinds of things they're going to have. LED drivers. And we're doing DC to DC conversion. Now one thing that we do want to think about is the DC to DC converter design. Almost certainly we want a DC to DC in terms of the efficiency, but we want to make sure 
that we don't then see any of the ripple on the camera that we've got attached to the microscope. So we do want to try and use something that's relatively high frequency so that that doesn't show up in the actual image. Now we picked the DC to DCs. Uh, internal switch, we probably do want these because we're probably going to end up with four LED drivers on this PCB, I would imagine. And we want LED drivers, well if we can get ones with an input voltage of at least 15 volts, that could, means we can run two of the LEDs in series, so we're already off to a good start there. Um, I'll actually narrow down that selection because these are probably ones for mains powered LEDs. Let's leave it at 48 volts in stock and see what we're left with here. So we've got one here from Texas Instruments. Um, first of all looking out for the bigger names and the ones that have any simulation capabilities. So TI always have the models available to look at on the website. Let's have a look at what this actually is. So this is a one amp output and we do have a dimming pin so we would be able to decrease the brightness one thing to note about that dimming pin is it does ideally want to be an analog input so that we don't then superimpose our lower frequency PDRM waveform, which then again will show up on the camera. Alternatively, if it is PDRM, which it does look like, we want to be able to feed in a relatively high frequency. So let's see what this data sheet is saying. So 1 amp, 3 to 15 volts, so we'll be able to run two of those LEDs in series. So unfortunately, after having a look through some of the data sheets, it looks like it's not quite as straightforward with this device because it needs a very specific voltage on the boost pin. And when you've got LED arrays, which is basically what we're going to have, it's a little bit more difficult to derive that. And it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do that with these LEDs that need 6 volts or 12 volts. So we're going to have to can the idea of the LM3405. So other parts in the list are... The LED 2000DR, let's have a look at that one. That's a 3 amp step down current source, 850 kilohertz switching frequency. And the topology looks fairly straightforward. Let's see if they've got any of those actually in stock. So that was the LED 2000. And so no, unfortunately no stock, so we'll cut that one out. Got some here from Diodes Inc. Let's see what this part is. It's quite a low cost device, 22 cent, 6 volts all the way up to 36 volts. So we could even drive all four LEDs in one go with this one. Switching frequency up to 1 megahertz and up to one amp. So actually, this one looks like it could do everything. We'd only need one of these parts in the entire design. Um, dimming range, 20 to 100%. Now, in terms of the dimming, actually, I'm only likely to need two dimming levels, 50% and 100%, probably. We might want to tweak the value, but we can usually do that with the current sense resistor. I don't really want to have a microcontroller or any software on this board. I just want it to be a, a standalone ring light that just works. Uh, DC dimming. So it can be done with a control voltage rather than PWM. So that's pretty good. Because as I said with the PWM dimming we may end up seeing that on the camera. So this actually looks like quite a decent device. Um, they've got everything that we need in the datasheet. And they've got a pretty good layout here. This is really quite small. So let's see if they've got these available. AL8805. And yes, they've got 1,826 available. SOT23 package. So I think we're going to do the design with that part. Now the next stage is to fill in the blanks. We know that the LEDs that we're using, we want to drive them at 700 milliamps maximum. And to keep things straightforward, I think we don't want to use any excessive input voltages. 24 volts is probably the practical limit. Therefore, with their operating voltage somewhere in the region of 6 volts, we're probably going to need two of these AL8805 drivers so that we can drive two LEDs per driver with 
four in series, that's 24 volts, and then there's no headroom for the actual driver to do the switching and the sensing. So yeah, we definitely need to use two different drivers. So in the data sheet, they describe how to calculate the various components. For R1, that is the current setting resistor. And in, unusually on this design, the current setting resistor is on the high side. Normally that's switched uh, down to ground. And they've written this in really quite an odd way in the LED current control section. Basically, if you look at the earlier table, you can see here that the set current threshold voltage is basically the voltage that it's trying to achieve across R1. So 100 millivolts is what we're trying to control. Therefore, if we want a 700 milliamp drive current, we can simply do 0.1 divided by 0.7 volts, which gives us about 142 milliohms. So somewhere in the region of that, we don't need to be too critical because we have got the uh, current control setting voltage here, which we're gonna be using for dimming the LED up and down. So 142 milliohms. And then let's look at the next section. Do we, so we don't need to be concerned about the dimming just yet. We then want to have a look at the capacitor selection and reducing the output ripple. So compared with some of the data sheets from TI and Linear Technology, there's not a lot of hugely technical information in this data sheet. If you take, for example, the input capacitor C1, all they've written here is a 2.2 microfarad capacitor is generally okay. However, you might want to use a 4.7 mic capacitor if the input voltages are higher. So not hugely descriptive there, We'll probably end up using just a couple of ceramic capacitors if we can find them with a suitable voltage rating to achieve that sort of 4.7 microfarads. At the input to the IC, we probably still will have one biggish electrolytic on the input to the PCB. So I've noted down 4.7 microfarads there. They've also just said that you can decrease the ripple current on the output, which will um, improve the LED performance. Just adding one microfarad across the LED will improve the ripple current by a huge amount. So uh, by a factor of three. So we'll add in that one microfarad. We may be able to find something a little bit juicier than that just to give us slightly better ripple current. But I, I don't like these data sheets a huge amount because it does look like you're generally just guessing component parts. There's no calculations here that we're really doing to give us you know, pinpoint accuracy on those components that we need to use. And again, if you look at the diode selection, they've been really vague here. Just basically says use a Schottky diode with a voltage rating at least 15% higher than the operating voltage. So not a lot, again, to go on. Normally, again, what you see in the TI data sheets, they'll give some recommended parts that have low capacitance or are more suited to the design. So really vague stuff here. Now, unfortunately, again, they've been really brief in the data sheet and there's actually no information about inductor selection. They've just got this one example here saying about using a 33 microhenry in this application, but absolutely no information about how they've got there. Now, what we do know is that this device is capable of having a switching frequency of one megahertz. We know our input voltage is going to be 24 volts in this application, and that our output voltage is also going to be about 12 volts. Although we're doing current control, our actual output voltage is still around 12 volts, so we can estimate the inductor value based on that. We know the duty cycle, therefore, is around 0.5 because our input voltage is 24 and our output is around 12 volts. And therefore, we can do some inductor calculations here using E equals L di by dt. We're also, so we've got the, our ripple current here, which is the di by dt element, along with our switching frequency, and we know our input and output voltages. So we can see that if we only want a ripple of 200 milliamps in that inductor, our uh, inductor value should be around 30 microhenries. So 33, again, actually is quite a reasonable estimate for the inductor that we can use in here. If we start using lower inductor values, we'll see more ripple current. And if we use bigger ones, we will see less. And it did say that we could get away with having more ripple current in the inductor, by compensating for that with this capacitor C2 in the circuit here. So we've got a little bit of headroom to play around with. From recollection, 
We do have some surface mount parts on JLC PCB's website. Let's have a little look and see what options we have. Do we have anything that's 33 microhenries? We do, and we've got some power inductors here. In fact, we've got 428 in stock of that part. So we're probably not doing too bad. I think we may well go ahead with that choice. So I've just started to draw out the schematic in Proteus. I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible in this design. We could over-engineer it to the nth degree. Let's try and keep it quite simple. So I've got our 24 volt input on the left hand side with a Schottky diode for reverse polarity protection. And then that just goes straight into a relatively large bulk capacitor because this thing is going to be on the end of a relatively long piece of cable. And so we do want to have that reserve storage on the PCB. Then with regards to the actual LED driver itself, here is our AL8805. And we've got a ceramic capacitor on the input pin as requested. We've got a current setting resistor, which is about 0.4 ohms for the types of current that we want to get out of these LEDs. We've got a Schottky diode uh, inductor, which I haven't put a value on just yet. And then we've got a ceramic capacitor across those LEDs to try and reduce the ripple currents. Now, when I was having a little look around, I did find the user guide for one of the evaluation boards for this chip. So... The actual specifications here are pretty similar to what we're trying to achieve in this design. Um, so you can see supply voltage up to 30 volts with 680 milliamps output. We're aiming for 700, so this is pretty much on the mark. So we could probably almost lift this design almost exactly. You can see here they've used a, 608, uh, a 68 microhenry inductor. And if we can find one at JLC PCB in the size that we want then obviously we can use that as well and that will reduce the ripple current even further. Now the nice thing about this is it's slightly better written than the data sheet and it does actually indicate how to control the control pin for dimming the LEDs. And basically you can control it with a PWM signal as we know, but you can also just drive in a DC voltage into that control pin. And basically it says here, drive with a DC voltage 0.4 volts to 2.5 volts or with PWM up to 5 volt logic level to adjust the output current. And I really don't want to start having microcontrollers or anything like that on this design. So really I think what we're going to end up doing is just having a lower voltage rail somewhere in this design and simply using a potentiometer because um, the actual control that we need is probably going to be on a relatively high setting but once we've set it up once we're not really going to tweak it, so we don't need the complication of firmware or anything like that. So what we'll probably end up doing is dropping the supply voltage down to something more reasonable with a linear regulator, down to 5 volts or something like that, having a series resistor and then a potentiometer, and we may need to buffer the output from that potentiometer, and then we can simply just feed it into the control pin. So we've got plenty of small 5 volt regulators. These are 78L05s in a SOT89, so quite a small compact package. We're hardly going to be dissipating any power here, so we can just pick any of these. We just need to check that the input voltage is within range. It should be for a 78L05. And we can see here, maximum input voltage 30 volts. So yes, we can actually use the 78L05. I'll just create the symbol and then add that into the schematic. And so this is what I've come up with. Basically, we've got a 78L05 in quite a small package. We don't need to worry too much about the power dissipation from this because although we are dropping from 24 volts down to 5 volts, we're actually only drawing about 1 milliamp peak from the 5 volt rail, so the power dissipation isn't very high. We've got about 250 microamps going through this resistor divider network. And what the datasheet says is that at 0.5 volts with analog control we get about 25% brightness. Anywhere below that and the switch mode power supply actually switches off. So our minimum brightness with analog control is 25%. And then when we feed in 2.5 volts into that control line that is where we get our 100% brightness control. So we've got a resistor divider network here and basically at this point here where the potentiometer is we should have 2.5 volts based on the sum of all these resistors together. And on the ground side, by adding in another resistor to lift that side of the potentiometer up, we're at about 0.48 volts. So what that means 
is that when the potentiometer is at the very lowest range, we may just see that the LEDs turn off and then jump up to 25% as soon as we start turning it up. Now that's feeding into a Unity game buffer, and we're just using a microchip MCP6001. These are really nice little op amps, rail to rail input and output, very low quiescent current, and I've used these a lot. They're really nice low cost devices and perfectly within our supply voltage range. And then we've just got a small filter on the output. Now the reason uh, that I've done that, originally I was just going to put a series resistor just because I wanted to isolate the output of the op amp from the input to the LED drivers because this op amp can have trouble driving capacitive loads and the data sheet doesn't go into enough detail about that control voltage input pin as to what the load looks like. So by isolating it with a series resistor then we also get the effect of protecting the performance of this op amp. Now what I've done here is just put in a small filter. We don't have to fit C7 but it might just smooth things out and uh, you know make the output voltage a bit smoother. So that's the analog brightness control and then we've got the two LED drivers. So these are two copies of each other, exactly the same as what we looked at a moment ago. And then we've just got this V control signal going into the control pins on both. Now, because we're using the PCB assembly service for the power board, that is restricted to a green PCB with 1.6 millimeter thickness. So we'll probably get that as the main PCB that sits around the microscope lens. And then on each corner, we'll have a satellite PCB with the LED, the optics, and the heatsink on it. And that would just be a standard PCB. We can easily just reflow the LEDs from that. And one thing that I have noticed in the past is when you have LEDs with the optics mounted on it, sometimes you do get some color transfer from the PCB color silk screen that you've got on there. So we do want to pick a white silk screen and we do also want to panelize the actual PCB because although our 25 by 25 millimeters, which is probably the size of the PCBs that we're going to use for the LEDs, you can see even there, it's still going to cost $51 just for the five boards. So if we go back to our 100 by 100 millimeters and panelize it, you can see that the cost increase is not that much more. We'll get 16 boards per panel and therefore we'll actually have tons and tons of LED boards and we can use those for other things in the future. The other thing that we might want to think about is the PCB thickness and the standard obviously is 1.6 millimeters. Our PCB itself is going to be the LED, PCB and then a heat sink on the other side with thermal wires going between it but the thinner that PCB the less thermal resistance there is between one side and the other. So with 1.6 you can see it's about $57 if we drop down 0.8, still the same, 0.6 millimeters, still $57, but then when we drop down to 0.4, um, if we go back to white, you can see that's quite considerably more expensive. So I think the 0.6 millimeters is probably a happy medium um, that should give us reasonable uh, value for money for those PCBs. There's nothing else that we need to choose on here, and then I just need to get those boards made. So we'll do a follow-up in a few days when I've started the PCB layout and we can work through that and see some of the considerations, thermal considerations, and also the considerations around the DC to DC converters. And we can run that through and actually get the PCB ready to send out to JLC PCB. Hopefully you found the design process interesting. It's a relatively simple design, but I know a few of you have asked if we can do a step-by-step -step on how to select some of the components and uh, some of the design process early on. So hopefully this has been useful and interesting, especially to those that are just starting out with designing their own PCBs and schematics. So if you've got any comments or thoughts, leave them in the comments down below. There's a few days before I'm going to get to the point where any changes that are suggested are going to be a bit more tricky to implement. So you've got a bit of time here to influence the design, so uh, any feedback would be appreciated. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Until next time, thanks for watching.